Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for joining me in this uh, live webinar from uh, beautiful Ojai, California. This webinar today is about uh, maybe the oldest profession in the world. No, not that old profession. Maybe the second oldest profession in the world, and that's uh, herbalism. You know, since the beginning of uh, history, you know, uh, humans have been uh, often mimicking animals and watching animals, and observing what they took when um, they needed to heal their bones or broken bones. Just like a dog will eat grass when he has stomach upset. It's all indigenous people have herbal systems. So there's herbal systems in South America and the Native Americans had uh, uh, different herbs that they used. Um, and of course, the Chinese have a quite sophisticated herbal system. And then the Indians, uh, in Southern India in particular, uh, had a very sophisticated herbal system. And they documented it quite a bit. And so did the Chinese. So now we have a very sophisticated uh, herbal systems in the world. First, I just want to talk about, you know, that there's um, many different forms of herbs. Most people are, are thinking of herbs maybe just like, you know, a bag of herbs, like this is... Uh, Lavender, you know, and lavender could be just used in like a little pillow and put it with a, ba a baby to help the baby sleep, you know, or, or, but in fact, herbs are in many forms uh, besides just teas or loose or herbs, which are often uh, used as a decoction or an infusion. But in Ayurveda, they're mostly used in a powder form, like here. We have a, an anti-inflammatory formula and uh, we have shalaki, or better known as frankincense powder, in here um, with some other herbs like uh, guduchi and amlaki and or curcumin extract. So in powder form, you can digest the um, herb like you would food, and it has much more effect than, say, a tea. Uh, for example, if, I, if you had kidney stones, I could give you this tea, uh, kidney stone tea with, um, you know, different herbs like gravel root that break down and dissolve kidney stones. But in fact, a powder would be more potent. And often we give people both the powder and the, the tea for decoction. And if you decoct a tea, like you boil it, roots, stems, seeds should be boiled, not just have, and, and the part, part of the water should come down. So it's a decoction. It gets dark. Um, that's going to be much stronger than just pouring hot water on it and doing an infusion and let it sit there. There are some formulas where you even just pour cold water on herbs or warm water and let it sit overnight. It's called a cold infusion. But mostly uh, decoctions are stronger than infusions and a uh, hot infusion is stronger than cold infusion tea. And uh, churna or powder is going to be stronger. For example, here we have a thyroid formula for this is for hypothyroid and we have no equivalent T um, because you know the thyroid gland it, it becomes congested and blocked and no longer produces its hormones and it's a type of blockage uh, but you need a quite a strong formula to break it down so when it comes to you know strong or chronic health conditions, the powder is more effective because you have the whole herb, you're in digesting the whole herb, not just the extract or the uh, uh, decoction of the herb. But we have other forms too. Herbs come in for those who are weak or sensitive or very dry. Herbs also come in ghees. They're called grittas. This is a brain ghee, we call it, made of the famous Ayurvedic formula uh, Saraswati. Um, and it's been prepared in ghee, so very soothing, very gentle, um, and uh, suitable for people for that. Even for nerves, uh, you know, uh, for example, Parkinson's or any serious nerve problem, we'd want those herbs in ghee, um, not in a dry form. Uh, and particularly if somebody want to detox somebody's liver and the, they're they're very weak and they're very dry, the powder herbs can be a little too dry, and so. Again, we, we would provide that in ghee. It's we call it a gentle liver detox. You know, this cleans the blood as such. And now sometimes herbs need to be in liquid, like when you're trying to reach the kidneys, when we work with people who have a kidney failure or 
weak kidneys, then you know we give uh, a lot of the herbs in uh, tea form, and we have to drink them in a lot of water, so they fl they go down to the urinary tract. If we take them after meals or with food, then they weren't not going to make it to the urinary tract, the bladder or the kidneys. Um, so we have to have them in liquid because we want them to go to that area. Same when you have a urinary tract infection. You say you take little Herva Ursi capsules with your meal, you won't get rid of the infection. But if you take Herva Ursi uh, tea, which is one of the active ingredients in here, and a base of nettle with a little horsetail, juniper berry, slippery elm, and astringent white oak. So you just take this for four or five days, and that will uh, take care of your urinary tract infection. But you have to have it in liquid form, and you have to drink it throughout the day, and you have to you know, drink it with a lot of liquid to flush it out and get it to that part of the body. We also have um, we call rishtas in Ayurveda. They're fermented. Um, is another anti-inflammatory uh, sub substance, and this is from India, made in India, flown in from India. There we go. We got the camera on it there, and it's called a rishta, and uh, it's fermented. The herbs are in here with a little cane sugar, and they're fermented for a few months. And the advantage over those is that this fermentation you know, increases the appetite and also rushes into the body and the uh, effect is quicker. Your body doesn't really have to digest it when it's got a little bit of alcohol in it. Um, and then of course tinctures. I don't use alcohol tinctures, but I do make um, vinegar tinctures. So this is like a cilantro tincture. Uh, apple cider vinegar is very acidic and many people who have strong appetites and a lot of stomach acids can get acidity for it. So if I want to give them apple cider vinegar, say in a heavy metal cleanse, then I can give them my cilantro um, tincture. And cilantro is very sweet and cooling. It takes the edge off of the um, apple cider vinegar. And here's another one like a headache tincture. And the advantage of tinctures is they, they just rush into the body quickly. That, you know, they, they go in and they act very fast and they're already broken down so you know it works very good for like a headache and it's got of course white willow bark in it and that's why it helps with your headache another uh form is in like a little oil this is another brain oil here yep yep see there okay and it's got herbs in oil and uh then you put it in your nostrils so sometimes when people have respiratory problems or even just you're trying to reach somebody's brain or trying to reach uh, uh, in the mind, then you just inhale it, you know, through the nose. Just take a couple drops and put in both sides. And this, you can feel it right in the, in the brain. So it's a, you know, these different forms of the herbs are allowing the herbalist to, to reach the systems or the tissue or the place in the body that's needed to be reached. And then we have oils too. Uh, we have different oils. This is a, uh, we call pitta oil. It's a cooling by nature. Yeah, see that? Pitta oil. And it's in um, sunflower oil. So this is good for people who have inflammation, heat, burning sensation on the feet, and, and are, are very hot by nature. It's a cooling oil. Cooling and calming. So uh, if you put it on the body, the whole body cools down. Um, and if you have congestion or blockage, we have this one, kapha oil. Well, there's hundreds of these oils, talums, and this one's just called kapha. I'm just taking a few off the shelf for you. It's more uh, invigorating and clearing. We use this for, um, for example, um, varicose veins. We use it for uh, blockages, lumps, tumors, cysts. Anything that we want to dissolve and break it down. This is very hot, very heating oil. And say somebody has a, a type of lump or uh, on, on their body, and they can use, put this oil on every day and massage it every bit, and it starts to break it down and dissolve it. It's very hot oil. And then uh, we have another one here. I just brought a few up called Vata oil. And it's also, these are oils infused with the herbs. So that's the ingredients there showing you all the herbs. And this one is very relaxing and warming. Uh, for example, if you massage your whole body with this, 
you know it's going to absorb in through your skin reach your much of your nerves and of of course you're going to feel very relaxed and very calm and it, we often use it just to put on the temples or the forehead for headaches we put a little on the feet to relax have another uh, herbal oil sleeping oil we put it on the feet of babies and children it just absorbs slowly through the feet and they go to sleep here's a, a bomb it's actually a sleeping bomb and it works very well I, I I put it just under my nose and I sleep better and I take it on a plane it's it's very funny how you wouldn't think it's very uh, powerful being just a little bomb that you inhale there but it, it does work and I like that product we also want to think about how to take the herbs so those were the different types of herbs we've got teas we've got powders we've got tinctures oh we got essential oils too this is frankincense essential oil I have many essential oils frankincense mirth you know I'm not using essential oils that much as you know I know some people they're only using essential oils but they have a limited um, uh, ability they're sometimes over promoted and as cure-alls but nothing's a cure-all everything has a, a, a way to use it properly and a way to um, uh, it can be used so essential oils uh, for example we get headaches again we're just on headaches today we put a little a couple drops of frankincense right in the mouth and even just a couple drops up the nose it's uh, very uh, effective um, and of course it works very good as an infusion in the room uh, to uh, affect the whole atmosphere and such and sometimes I add the essential oils into my uh, herbal oils to give them more effect that's why I have this frankincense oil on the shelf because I have a few anti-inflammatory herbal oils and if the people have a lot of inflammation I put a couple dro uh, eye droppers full of uh, frankincense in there and mirth of course is very good for the skin so those are the two that I tend to use the most just because they have anti-inflammatory aspects to them and I usually add them to other herbal oils that I'm using so you've got oils you've got geese you've got fermented ones you've got decoctions and mostly we're using in Ayurveda is the powders like for example we have the gallbladder churna you know a lot of people are getting gallbladder attacks you know these days in the spring and um, so we use that one there cholesterol lowering these are all powders you just mix them with a little water they're not uh, made to be teas or anything so and this will help lower the blood fat and you know all these are formulas we're never really using single herbs uh, formulas are always working much better than single herbs so next we got to talk about um, uh, how to take them now it was called the anupana or the carrier what carries the herb to the right spot uh, a lot of these herbs are taken with water obviously the tea but many of them I have people take them with aloe vera I have people take them with honey uh, many times I want these herbs taken with um, uh, milk and um, these are the more common carriers so it's very important too. Sometimes like when people, I give them colon herbs or laxative herbs to take in the evening and I know they're dry, I tell them to mix it with some hot water and then put in one teaspoon of ghee or butter to help to make it more moist and avoid any dryness in the colon. In a lot of inflammatory conditions, I tell people to mix the churna or the powder with the hot water and then add uh, a couple of tablespoons of aloe vera to it so that's also very common and for respiratory conditions for expectorants and decongestants you know I often add uh, have people add honey to it which helps break up the mucus make the the decoction more uh, thick and allow it to um, cling to the throat and absorb into the the chest cavity better being in honey so you have to get the right formula then the formula should be in the right form for that individual and then you have to accompany it um, in some type of carrier uh, oil butter ghee aloe vera honey even cane sugar sometimes we tell people just mix a little cane sugar in with it and that rushes it into the body and you get a very fast results 
um, when you mix a little cane sugar in it. And then the next thing we wanna learn about herbs is uh, when to take the herbs. You know, it's always the details that are important. Some of my patients, they have the herb, uh, but they're taking it in the wrong manner. For example, uh, you can't take all herbs in capsules. Uh, it doesn't, they just don't work. And you can see I didn't bring up any capsules here because capsules are harder to digest. They bypass the tongue and the tongue uh, is receiving some of the information about the herb. I mean, it's bitter or pungent or astringent taste, which you don't like. So people put them in capsules. But in fact, it's important for the body to taste these herbs, feel these herbs, and that you know, communicates to the body the action these herbs are gonna have. So uh, I don't provide any herbs in capsules. In, you know, this is a more modern approach <laughs> to herbalism. And often if they're just taken with the meal, they're very uh, ineffective. Many people come to me with ashwagandha capsules and they're taking one a day like they would allopathic medicine. But ashwagandha is a very building, strengthening, uh, uh, adaptogen herb and you really need teaspoons of it. So when it's in capsules, people have a little jar of ashwagandha capsules they bought for $30. I said, you'd probably have to take, you know, 10 of those and you would feel quite good. But instead, I would just give you a big jar of ashwagandha, some licorice, some Vidari Khan and a little herbs like ginger and cumin in it to help you digest it because it is a heavy herb. And then you have a formula that's easier to digest. And now you can take teaspoons of it and you can really feel the benefits. And also, of course, quality is everything with herbs. So just because you have an herb, whether it's Tulsi or ashwagandha or even turmeric, which has become America's first uh, uh, favorite uh, herb, turmeric, um, which for a while I, people thought was a cure-all, uh, but they were just taking it in capsules when in fact Ayurveda, they mostly just cooked with it because it's not that potent. Um, and then people took one capsule um, and then they, they didn't feel results. But now, of course, we have turmeric extract. I'm not using a lot of extracts because I don't need to, but extracts, you know, they're, they're taking away from part of the whole herb. And um, even though turmeric extract can help with inflammation, it won't cure your arthritis as the whole herb would be doing much better for you. So I encourage you to take whole herbs, not extracts, and in their natural state, not in capsule form. And then the next thing you need to know or a herbalist should inform you is when to take the herbs. A lot of herbs like liver herbs, gallbladder herbs are taken before the meal to, uh, to affect the, the liver like bitters, you know, in the old days, they used to take their bitters before a meal and that would stimulate their liver, stimulate digestive enzymes. A lot of uh, our carminative herbs are also taken before the meal to stimulate, stimulate the digestive enzymes and the uh, pancreatic enzymes and the, and the saliva in the mouth. So you take it before the meal and it stimulates the digestive system and improves your appetite and ultimately your digestion. A lot of herbs are, that are very strong are taken after meals. Um, and then sometimes you have to take them between meals. Sometimes you have to take them on empty stomach. And sometimes you have to take them first thing in the morning. A lot of calming and nervine herbs for people with anxiety. We have them just take it first thing in the morning. So this will help them throughout the whole day. And then many laxatives or purgative herbs that take you know six, seven, eight hours to have effect. We want to take them late at night so we have the effect six to eight hours later when we wake up in the morning. So timing is very important. So often it's the details that are very important. So even if you had the right formula, <laughs> you still got to know how to take it, when to take it, and how much to take. Obviously, a person who's only 100 pounds will take a, a much smaller dose than a person who's 200 pounds. So, uh, and some people are more sensitive than other people. So. You know, if you have a very sensitive person, then, you know, you have smaller doses and you can put it in other forms, liquid forms and ghee forms that are, are more palatable and more uh, easy on the system. So you have to have it in the right form. OK, so now we're just going to talk about some actions, just some common actions of herbs. And I have some samples all around me. Uh, I've <laughs> surrounded myself 
with uh, uh, different herbs to give you as an example. Uh, so um, alternative herbs. These are uh, herbs that are like a blood cleansing herbs the, uh, that are going to Im Im thin your bile, uh, uh, improve liver function, and clean the blood out. You know, a most common one we know would be aloe vera. There's two classifications of these alternative herbs, and that is uh, cooling ones and heating ones. And this is a very important point. If a person is very hot and sweaty and they get hot easy, we want to use more cooling herbs. And if a person is cooler and in, in body temperature, we want to use more warming herbs. Otherwise, we will aggravate the existing condition. So in fact, even you know the herbs and how to take them, different individuals still will do better with different herbs. In fact, you can treat a person for, say, gallbladder uh, congestion with Indian herbs, Chinese herbs, Western herbs. I mean, I could use my Indian herbs. I could use my Western herbs. I have some Chinese herbs here too. And it's not so much that one herb is uh, the cure. It, it's the knowledge of the herbs and the formula that's made that you know will do the job. And then the dosage is right. The timing is right. So some of the cooling uh, alternative herbs are like aloe vera, burdock root, dandelion root, echinacea, um, Indian herbs like manjista, guduchi, and neem, and sandalwood, uh, are, and um, sarsaparilla. But I have a blood detox formula, I have a liver uh, uh, tea, I have multiple cooling liver herbs, warming liver herbs. So of course, in Ayurveda, we have liver herbs for pitta, liver herbs for vata, liver herbs for kapha. Some of the heating um, alternative herbs, which are you know generally for the liver and the blood, uh, asafahita, bay leaf, black pepper, cayenne pepper, cinnamon, clove, and even garlic. So uh, many people, of course, uh, take garlic uh, for even its antimicrobial actions. But it may not be the best choice if you're having acidity, heartburn, low, high stomach acids, and a high body temperature. So you have to choose the right uh, herb for the particular person, too. But um, so it's important that understand that herbs aren't healing uh, a condition. There's no herb that's going to heal you from a certain health condition. No, herbs have actions. They have certain actions. And you combine them together in a formula and maybe two, three different formulas. Um, and then you're able to create the actions that you need for the body to recover from the condition. So if you have a person with um, uh, skin problems, rashes, allergies, hives, uh, uh, any form of liver toxicity, then you could use these uh, alternative herbs to clean the blood and improve the liver function. Uh, and then you pick the right ones for the individual. Next, we have antimicrobial herbs. And, uh, you know, these are strengthening the uh, body's natural defense mechanism against pathogens and uh, microorganisms. And they work quite well. Um, herbalists have been fighting pathogens and viruses and bacteria since the beginning of time. And they don't have a, a difficulty with this. Um, and, you know, we could further classify these as antifungal, anti septic, uh, anti-parasitical, uh, antiviral, and, um, and then again, we could classify them as pungent or heating ones, and we could also classify them as uh, uh, cooling antimicrobials. So again, you'd have to pick the, the ones that's most suitable for you. Um, examples would be uh, herbs like of, that are heating would be a garlic, uh, which was, I think they called it the Russian antibiotic at one point. So it is very effective in large doses for fighting, uh, uh, you know, viruses and particularly uh, bacteria and parasites. Cayenne um, is another uh, one, but mostly we're using more cooling herbs so we can, we can take them in uh, a, a larger, larger amounts than um, these uh, heating herbs, you know, and then we have like echinacea and um, uh, guduchi and manjista and neem. 
These are the cooling ones, and they can be taken in larger doses. But again, just like an antibiotic, if you took some of these herbs, particularly like neem in excess, you know, it could because of its cooling, dry, and bitter nature, it could actually affect adversely your digestive system. And you can start to, if you take it for too long, you could uh, adversely affect your own intestinal uh, bacteria um, in your body, just like taking an antibiotic uh, does. Now, mostly uh, we don't we don't have to worry, but you know, if you take it too long, there are people that I've known that have taken neem for excessive periods of time, and it's also considered an anti-aphrodisiac and reduces sperm count in men, and uh, eventually will uh, reduce your own intestinal flora in your body. So, you know, you don't want to keep taking a strong antimicrobial for a long period of time. It's just to do the job for that particular time. And of course, different antimicrobial uh, uh, herbs are suitable for different organs in the body, depending on where the uh, pathogen or uh, microorganism is in the body. Next, we another action of herbs is antipyretic or bitter herbs. You know, the old days used to take bitter tonics, and these are mostly to improve digestion, particularly of fat, um, and they uh, increase uh, your appetite, improve your digestion, help to eliminate toxins from the body, particularly of the liver, purify the blood. But again, they are cold, dry, and somewhat depleting and reducing. So you generally, we take them in small amounts, just quarter teaspoon, half teaspoon, or even just pinches uh, before our meals. Um, and they're good at, um, you know, helping the uh, uh, liver produce more bile, reducing acidity, and, uh, of course, expelling heat from the body. And uh, they're called bitters. And, of course, aloe vera, barberry, chikrot, dandelion root, golden seal, guduchi, kukti, neem, organ grape are all in that category. Uh, and we have quite a few here. We have an immune formula here, respiratory immune, and the main ingredients is Tulsi, just backed up by a little licorice, cinnamon, and ginger. Very good at preventing colds and flus. Um, I drank it all winter and uh, never got even a runny nose or a sniffle, and I'm faced every day with people with colds and flus. Um, and I'm mostly providing this tea to people because by the time they come to me, they already have a cold. And there we see the echinacea, the sage, the organ grape root, some of these I just mentioned, even a little oregano leaf. So uh, most people have gotten back to me and said they've had uh, great results with that tea. I've sold it for many years. It take care of your average cold or flu in just a matter of days. And then we also have cough tea, uh, which is just uh, an expectorant with some antimicrobial herbs mixed in. And of course, if it's serious, we also will provide the powder. If the tea doesn't work, then we move to the powder. So next category or action of herbs that I want to cover, I have to keep going here. I'm going to probably do a video on uh, on YouTube, not a webinar, on each of these um, categories of herbs at a later date. So we're just kind of like an introduction to a whole series of videos that I'll be uploading to uh, YouTube um, on each of these categories. The next one is uh, aphrodisiac. Um, you know, and this is nourishing and stimulating to the sexual organs and tissue. Um, and this improves the health of the ovarium, promoting menstruation and lactation. And these are mostly stimulating uh, tonics and invigorating uh, the sexual organs. Um, and of course, the Chinese and all cultures uh, use these. Uh, and th they have both stimulating ones and not so stimulating ones. So a person with anxiety and nervousness, we would not use the stimulating ones. And a person who uh, has more lethargic and slow, then we would use more stimulating ones. Stimulating ones are clove, uh, daminia, which we have in our libido tea, uh, fenugreek, garlic, pipoli, and uh, raw onion, and shilajit. And um, ones that are more tonics, more rejuvenative, ashwagandha, bala, uh, ginseng, um, goat cola, kapikachu, licorice, lotus seed, marshmallow root, onion, saw pimento, sesame seeds, shatavari, 
uh, and saffron, and even cane sugar and wild yam. So you can see um, that I, I threw in some foods along there too. So you can see that food and herbs there there can be worked together. So all patients receive dietary guidelines and I may tell them, eat a lot of asparagus or eat a lot of wild yam. And there's a reason behind that um, because you're using food as medicine when you're asking somebody to eat a lot of a particular food. And no, we don't look at the nutritional content, whether it has potassium or magnesium. This is a, a different system here. We're, we're talking about the actions of these foods and the actions of these herbs because all herbs are is powdered up plants that aren't tasty enough to eat. We have uh, edibles, which are generally sweet and, and nourishing, which we use as food. And then you have spices, which are also tasty and, and used with the food. And then you have all the other plants, <laughs> which aren't tasty, but they have medicinal benefits. So I believe that you know our creator gave us everything we need and um, all of these plants have medicinal value it's just we don't understand them all but uh, there's still there's tens of thousands of known herbs in the world and there's uh, thousands more that uh, plants and we don't know about their therapeutic action yet and we're still learning lucky our ancestors spent uh, hundreds and hundreds of years if not thousands of years through trial and error and they learn this for us. So it's a very great knowledge. It's probably one of the greatest accomplishments of humankind was to uh, collect this information on the medicinal benefits of the plants, uh, which would include the stem, the roots, the barks, the leaves, the flowers, the seeds, and uh, minerals in the uh, world. And of course, some systems like the Chinese use more animal products. So the next action we want, and uh, we're only up to A, so I don't know if we're going to get through all these actions, is astringent, the astringent quality. You know, and this is constricting, binding action on the mucosa membranes in the body, the organs, the skin, and the other tissues. So this helps the, the uh, body, uh, prevents the body from losing water, reduces irritation, inflammation, uh, soothes the mucous membranes, and helps tissue heal. So, you know, when you, and examples are like a calendula. We use a calendula for sores and wounds and comfrey. We also use it. They have an astringent quality. And so some of these herbs are also used for, you know, excess bleeding for during menstruation, diarrhea, loose stools. You know, this is, this astringent quality, you know, helps to counteract this. If you notice that herbs are doing the opposite. So if you're too hot, you're going to get cooling herbs. If you're very hot, you're going to get cooling herbs. So if you're very cold, you're going to get heating herbs and warming herbs. And if you have loose stools, then you're going to have astringent herbs to kind of tighten up. That's why we don't, if somebody has constipation, we don't want them eating foods that are too astringent like beans. You know, it can be constipated. And uh, these are again broken down into uh, cooling and warming. Warming ones are like cayenne, cinnamon, ginger, and uh, there's cooling ones, ashoka, which we use uh, for women for excess menstrual bleeding. Um, and also maybe some women are familiar with a red raspberry leaf. It's also an astringent or uterine tonic. Golden seal, hibiscus, horsetail, jasmine, mangista, marshmallow root, mullein, nettle, uh, pomegranate. You know, you can get pomegranate. It's good for loose stools. And if you get the skin of a pomegranate, just grate it and make a tea out of it. It, can all, it stops diarrhea quite well. Um, and witch hazel, you know, you can do the witch hazel toner. You just make a decoction of witch hazel, put it on your skin, and it tightens up the skin and helps with wrinkles. And of course, you can go to the health food store and you can buy a witch hazel facial toner. And why that, and it's been this witch hazel has been used for wrinkles and you know for a long time and uh and it's because of its astringent quality tightening up the muscles and the skin and the tissue so next we're off to c <laughs> of actions here so i'll have to keep speeding it up carminative herbs carminative herbs normalize the function of uh digestion uh relieving gas abdominal distension bloating 
and um, you know they're they have these uh, volatile oils in them that stimulate digestion absorption burn off toxins improve circulation and you know dispel blockages in the body you know so we know that there's a lot of carminative herbs people are quite familiar with them uh, uh, ginger cumin coriander fennel here we have a little digestive tea very simple just coriander cumin fennel just slightly ground up um, and this is uh, very soothing for almost all people and you have that before meals we have other digestive tea with other carminative herbs in there including ajwan but you can ajwan the last ingredients but even peppermint it's a carminative cumin carminative ginger these are all stimulating the uh, digestion and in helping with gas and bloating there's our circulation tea also it's got some carminatives and stimulating herbs to help there so um, these are very common almost all clients were giving some type of carminative herb and a lot of times we put carminative herbs in other formulas just so you can uh, digest the formula better you know peppermint being the most famous carminative herb and the next we have demulcent herbs these are like rich in uh, mucilage and are soothing to inflamed and irritated mucosa membranes and they're usually very moist sweet soothing cooling reducing inflammations through the whole GI tract and create like a buffer you know so a lot of people they're getting hype become very sensitive um, and they need more mucosa in their stomach lining uh, you're getting too much acidity, you're getting burning. Of course, conditions like IBS and ulcerative colitis, you have to use a lot of demulcents to soothe and coat the intestinal lining. Uh, these are like bala, barley, barley as a drink. You can make barley water is very demulcent. If you ever got bar barley and soaked it in water overnight, and then you have this like uh, a mucky film on the top, will you drink that and it helps with burning urinary tract infection so when people have some condition like ulcerative colitis we have them drink eat barley as the main grain and it's because of this uh demulcent quality that we want also corn silk you know the little fuzz on the top of corn well you get that and you make a tea out of it and it's also very soothing and helps with burning and irritation and i don't have corn silk in my kidney uh, a tea, but it should be my kidney urinary tract tea. It would be very good. But I use instead another demulcent in that tea, marshmallow root. You know, so you can use the most common ones are comfrey, colt's foot, marshmallow root. Colt's foot we mostly use for cough. See that colt's foot? That's in the coughing formula. It stops the cough. There it is. Mullen, colt's foot, slippery elm, licorice. Those are all demulcents, soothing the respiratory, irritating cough and sore throat. So. Even though you have a demulcent, for example, well, some are going to be good in some parts of the body, like the GI system, while well, others will be good for the respiratory. But this colt's foot is very good for coughing, very soothing, and it's, it's demulcent quality is what we want. Also, for a laxative, sometimes we put in slippery elm, and uh, this just helps, you know, particularly if there was hemorrhoids or pain, we put the slippery elm in there to make it uh, uh, more soothing and more comforting so next is diaphoretic uh, herbs and these induce sweating in the body relieve fever aching uh, and help with the cold and the flu and you know there's many herbs in this category ajwan black pepper um, and you know when it's very important to be sweating um, we eliminate toxins in many ways in our body through um, the colon through uh, the urine and the urinary uh, track and also through uh, sweating. So when people aren't sweating, they're off. They're more susceptible to skin problems, rashes, and hives. So you know sometimes you want a person to start sweating. Uh, and again, there's warming and cooling ones. Uh, uh, warming ones: black pepper, cayenne, cinnamon, clove, ginger. You know that that circulation tea I showed you earlier. This definitely would have that effect as well you know it's we use it for varicose veins swollen limbs cold feet it's very warming but it's also got this same uh, 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 quality as as being uh, uh, diaphoretic and helping the body to sweat and you have cool ones too like 
a burdock root and coriander and puna rava and very commonly used yarrow. Next, we have diuretics. Diuretics are increasing the flow of urine and improving the secretion and elimination of uh, water. And so this is very good if you uh, for people who are obese, who have swelling, water retention, lymphatic swelling, urinary uh, conditions, kidney conditions, gallstones. Um, and, you know, but of course, like all actions, you know, you have to be careful. It could be very drying in nature and they can even cause constipation, dry skin and deplete the tissue. And you can see these kidney um, ones that I have. These are mostly a lot of uh, diuretics are in here like a horsetail, parsley leaf, and nettle with the antimicrobial herba ursi. So you've got the combination effect of the antimicrobial killing the bacteria, but you have the, the diuretic effect to help the, 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 the liquid to flow through the urinary system pathway, kidney, bladder, urinary tract to make sure that the other herb, the herba ursi, reaches the right point. So you wouldn't want to take those for too long. You become a little dry. And then next we um, um, we have other herbs, um, uh, amenagogues, and these are provoting, promoting and regulating menstruation. And we use them, of course, in teas and formulas for women. And again, there's cooling and heating ones. Um, the cooling ones, black cohosh, bl uh, musta, mangista, red raspberry leaf, very good as uterine tonic, rose flowers. Oh, I did bring some rose petal up here today. That would be in that category. Um, and then, of course, we have a, a tea for the ladies here, PMST, and we can find some of these um, herbs right in there. We can see there's wild yam, dong kwai, uh, there's willow bark for the pain. This is quite a sophisticated pro formula, but look, the first ingredient, red raspberry leaf, and then passion flowers, more for the nerves, and it's a nervine. Um, so there's a lot in that um, PMS uh, formula. Next, we have expectorants. Expectorants, you know, are expelling mucus from the lungs, the throat, the navel passages, and they're treated in colds, congestions. Um, so well, there's many herbs in this category. Um, they're classified in, in two categories. Those that are drying, like black pepper, calmus, cardamom, cinnamon, clove, uh, El Champagne, which is in our lung tea. Um, there's lung tea right there. See, El Champagne. Produces relief from respiratory congestion, cough, colds. What's the first ingredient? El Champagne. And there's colt's foot. Remember colt's foot? Good for coughing. There's marshmallow root or slippery elm, and that's the soothing demulcent in there. And then we're just putting a little ginger. The black pepper also, we mentioned, is an expectorant and decongestant. So once you understand actions of these herbs, and you can see this formula, and you can understand how it works. Um, but some are very drying, and so you have to match them to the person. So, you know, moistening expectorants are like colt's foot, comfrey root, flax seeds, uh, licorice, marshmallow root, slippery elm. And there's other ones just for cough. We'll move on here. Next is laxative herbs. Well, everybody knows are purgatives. Generally, we classify them as mild laxatives that are like just bulk building. So if you do um, licorice or prunes or psyllium husk or ground flaxseed or bran. These are bulking laxatives. They're very, very mild and um, they're good at absorbing water. So they help with dryness in the colon. Um, so f they work for as mild laxatives, we could say, because they actually in themselves have no laxative or purge effect. Um, so for, uh, then we have purgatives, which are more stimulating, the, the, in, not just stimulate the bowels, but stimulate the secretion of bile from the gallbladder, which also, you know, uh, triggers the, the bowel movement. And, um, you know, these are, again, they're classified as uh, heating or purgatives and uh, cooling ones. Uh, cooling ones are like a mandrake, uh, senna, rhubarb, 
and um, castor oil is a heating one. So, you know, sometimes we give people castor oil at night, uh, mild constipation, one teaspoon, you know, severe constipation, a uh, tablespoon or so. And these uh, laxatives, many people use them incorrectly. Like people say, oh, I can't take Senna, I can't take Carsada Sagrada, it harms me. But that's because they just took it straight. See, we're not never using these in a straight form. They're always mixed with other herbs, see. So I can mix, say, Senna or Carsada Sagrada with some demulcents like licorice or slippery elm, and that takes away the, the cramping effect. Even I could mix it with a little uh, chamomile, and there's actually one tea on the market um, that we find that uses senna plus chamomile and licorice. And why is the chamomile in there? Because it's antispasmatic, and that helps uh, you to not have any cramping or discomfort with the formula. So that's why formulas are so important and taking single herbs can actually get you in more trouble than just uh, uh, using a proper tested formula that gets the job done but doesn't have any adverse effects. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, strong laxatives in all cultures, you know, Haditaki and Ayurveda, um, aloe vera powder and rhubarb and senna are the more common ones. Carsada Sagrada is a cooling laxative um, and so is yellow dock. So you have to pick the right ones for a person. We have many, many formulas of laxative to pain based on the severity of the constipation, whether a person's dry or not dry, um, and whether their body temperature is warm or cold. Um, so we have to adjust it. The next is um, a lithotrypic uh, herbs or anti lithic herbs and these dissolve and eliminate stones uh, gallbladder stones kidney stones and uh, clean out the urinary tract they they have a breaking down effect they break down things you know gravel root which I think is um, in my kidney tea or the kidney kidney stone tea there it is kidney stone tea so it's got now we can look at these teas and we can analyze them there's nettle root, which is a diuretic. There's horsetail, another diuretic. And then there's the gravel root, number three, right there. And then marshmallow root, our slippery elm, this is a demulcent. And, um, and, and that's why it's working. But the gravel root is the active ingredient that's breaking down the stones. It's funny, this gravel root, it really looks like rocks. If you threw it on the ground, it's so hard. But, you know, when you boil it and use the the extract from it it breaks down you know your kidney stones and in fact a lot of herbs look like uh or have clues to what their uses is and clearly this is the case when we see this uh, uh root that looks like gravel i mean it's so hard you can't bite it um, but in fact when you make a tea out of it it dissolves stones in your body because it has those properties in it is another uh, herb we have for building bones and the leaf of the herb looks like a bone so you know many people believe that you know our creator tried to give us clues to what the plants are good for by looking at them and tasting them next we'll get into nervines here nervines are very important um, and um, you know they support your nervous system um, and they're good at calming and refreshing the mind increasing awareness, and a lot of different types of uh, nervines we have. Again, they're classified in Ayurveda as cooling nervines like catnip, chamomile, gotacola, jatamatsi, you know, even the lavender, motherwort, oat straw, passionflower, peppermint, sandalwood, skullcap. And we can see a lot of those are right here in this tea, like this relaxing tea. We can see it's just loaded with nervines. Skull cap, catnip, motherwort, lavender, oat straw, passion flower. And so what's the rosemary in there? It's just for circulation. Rose petals, well, it just makes it taste nice. Cinnamon, it's it's kind of like, a, you know, a binding agent. It just helps everything uh, work better together. And it's in a base of lemon balm, even though it's from the mint family, that is also a mild uh, nervine. And um, like I said, that cinnamon is like a catalyst. It helps all the herbs work a little better. So you want, 
you don't want too many cooling herbs in there so we put a little cinnamon and rosemary to help it you know circulate throughout the nervous system and in the same category we have uh, also sedatives um, and sedatives are also a type of nervine just more sedating and there we use them in our sleeping tea it's just full of them it's in that base of lemon balm again you know um, but there's the catnip chamomile lavender passion flower but what are the big sedatives here california poppy seed hops those are the two active ingredients and there we're using licorice as a catalyst to just kind of bring it all together and make the whole formula work better so that's going to help you uh, to sleep way better than just taking only chamomile and of course there's other nervines so just for the brain just to relax we're using and these are circulatory too we have ginkgo gota cola brahmi and there's that lemon balm again and there ginger and rosemary again the catalyst you know making it all work a little better and improving the circulation uh, to not just the the brain but the whole body um, so nervines are very important very effective we have many different nervine formulas to relax to sleep um, and then nutritive herbs we're gonna go faster here <laughs> you know uh, these are, are herbs to build and strengthen the tissue and they're usually sweet in taste and you can take them in large amounts they're most moist heavy soft building qualities and you know some of the more famous ones that we hear about are ashwagandha and shatavari and you know these are buildings so i mean some overweight people are taking ashwagandha and i said well it's a nice herb it's building and strengthening but it is a weight gainer and not recommended for those who are trying to uh, lose weight um, many of these nutritive tonics we could call it because they're like a tonic they're building uh, would include uh, even just cashews coconut comfrey root uh, dates uh, date sugar butter you know, a jaggery, licorice, um, almonds, amlaki, and, you know, some of the herbs I mentioned, like shatavari, vidar, vidari khand, and ashwagandha. So next, let's go to uh, rejuvenative herbs. And these are for strengthening. A lot of times after we do a cleanse and a detox for a person, you know, if they had a serious health issue, then afterwards we want to rejuvenate them and strengthen them back up and even put on more weight again we're going to see a little similarity here um, we're going to ashwagandha bala um, dashamula you know ginseng gugulus uh jaggery licorice you know sesame seeds sugar and even warm milk are rejuvenative so okay and then we got one more we'll do one more stimulants you know a stimulants they're invigorating the body enhancing the body's uh, function and you know black pepper cardamom cayenne ginger garlic um and l uh, here we have a few right here uh elethro and ginseng we take a look here there's our memory and energy tea and there we can see them there's even green tea in there denrao green tea and we got ginkgo which is a circulatory mild stimulant peppermint elethro which is also called um siberian ginseng and again, we're using a little rosemary and ginger as a catalyst to kind of just make the whole formula work better and give you a little energy and improve the circulation to the mind. So we call it memory and energy tea. So, you know, what uh, this is how we're making formulas. And most of these formulas have already been made. You know, I'm not really making them up. I mean, uh, herbal formulas have existed for uh, thousands of years. I have whole books on herbal formulas, and if I have all the herbs, I can make the formula. So I mostly stock single herbs, and then I have references to the formulas for the conditions. So there's really um, herbal formulas already made for every health condition there is. Of course, in ancient times, they didn't have some modern uh, ailments like AIDS and HIV, so they're not in uh, documented, but they had all other conditions that uh, tumors and blood pressure and you know uh, They needed aphrodisiacs and memory issues and you know, they were worried about uh, You know their digestion and elimination thousands of years ago and parasites. We didn't cover anti-parasitical Actions, there's a lot more actions that I just covered some main ones there. I started skipping over them at the end 
but uh, I hope this helped give you a, a better idea of the vast potential of using herbs to address your health concerns and understanding that it's quite sophisticated and to have a high success rate with yourself or clients, you have to have a good knowledge of uh, how these herbs are going to work together and more importantly sometimes is even the counterindications when not to use them. And so there's no one herb that's going to cure all of your health problems. Turmeric is not a cure-all. It's, you know, it's a mild, you know, anti-inflammatory and it's not really used much in Ayurveda for inflammation and pain because they have better choices and better herbs. So why it's mostly used, as I mentioned, for cooking, you know, um, and probably somebody's asking, well, what about CBD? You know, uh, the, the extract of cannabis without the THC. And, you know, it's not a cure-all either. I mean, I have a text where they talk about the ancient writings of cannabis and how it was used. And it's a, you know, mild sedative in some forms and some forms it's stimulating. It's good for reducing pain. And mostly in ancient times, they used it for social anxiety, nervousness, wedding nights, and things like that. They mentioned, you know, when it was a suitable, even in a festive environment like a wedding, they thought this was a best herb and they didn't smoke it. They, they had it in teas and powders and often they prepared it in milk to take away its drying effects. And of course, it has some analgesic qualities. We didn't even talk about analgesic qualities, pain reducing qualities. But you know, CBD is not going to uh, take away your arthritis. You may feel less pain, but it doesn't have the action that's necessary to go into your joints and clean out your joints. This is another action which we didn't cover. Here we're using googaloos and frankincense, um, you know, these resins, because they have the quality to go into the joints, clean out the toxins, and remove the inflammation and pain. Well, uh, just anesthetic or analgesic herbs like uh, cannabis, for that matter, are just going to reduce the pain, but you're still going to have the same problem. So it's not a cure all. But I mean, if you want to relax and you know enjoy your wedding and not be stressed out, or you know help reduce some muscle pain, then this is fine. But in no way is any one herb uh, a cure-all and that's truly the case in CBD and of course that's just an extract of the original plant so it's not even a complete herb at that point but it's good to know that in the West we're making progress we now have two main herbs that everybody knows about turmeric and uh, CBD so there are thousands and thousands of more herbs and thousands of formulas so it's better to you know have an herbalist to help you to prepare the right formulas uh, and herbs for you okay so um, I'll stop the recording now and if you have any questions you can ask your questions and uh, I'll continue uh, with those people who are logged in to answer your individual questions once again thank you very much I hope I inspired you to you know, go for herbal medicines, you know. Unfortunately, most people wait until they've already tried, you know, um, allopathic medicine and it hasn't worked. And then they come to me. But in fact, uh, and my success rate is very high. Uh, even I have testimonials from medical doctors um, over the years. So they do, they, we do get the results. Uh, but it would be better if people came in the early stages and you know and if it becomes a life-threatening condition then you know you should see your medical doctor but it's best to address all of your health conditions in these early stages herbs are not a cure for everything in a later stage in an advanced stage where there's damage to the tissue it's very uh, difficult to uh, reverse and uh, herbalists are well aware that when a condition is too advanced then they're not capable of treating it but in the early stages um, it's uh, the best time to address these blood sugar issues, these blood pressure issues, these cholesterol issues. And of course, every herbal uh, uh, treatment should be accompanied with dietary guidelines. That's why I don't sell my herbs online. I require an appointment 
where I can give the person dietary guidelines, lifestyle guidelines, because in fact, we are all creating most of our health conditions with our diet and our lifestyle habits. So these need to be adjusted because they're the cause and then the herbal formulas will have the actions that we need. Uh, one other good point is these herbs are not necessary to take forever. Even people who take these colon herbs, even though they're called laxatives, after a, a few months, they don't need them anymore because it cleans the colon. They have actions. You know, you have high blood pressure and you're taking these cardiovascular herbs. They're cleaning the arteries. They're relaxing the heart muscles. You don't have to take them forever because they solve the problem. They're not addressing the symptoms. Uh, they're addressing the causes. And when you just put a pain oil on you or CBD oil on you, you're not addressing the causes to your joint pain. You're just, you know, addressing the symptoms. So it's very important, you know, even herbalists can make this mistake and just be addressing only symptoms and not causes. Once again, thank you very much. Please contact me if, if you like more information and stay um, here if you have some questions. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.